Now today what I like to do is I like to share with you principles of interpretation. So you can go through the scriptures as easily as I can and interpret scriptures. Now we're all going to find scriptures that are difficult to interpret. So today we're going to find out what do we do with those scriptures when we find scriptures that are difficult to interpret. Why would they be difficult to interpret? Because they seem to contradict another passage of scripture or they seem to contradict a cardinal doctrine. A cardinal doctrine of the church regarding salvation is the perseverance of the saints, meaning that God keeps those who he saves. He keeps them unto the uh, everlasting life. So if you would run into any particular passage of Scripture that would contradict that or contradict what we have been teaching here out of Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30, you know immediately something's wrong with that passage of Scripture. So your job is now, what am I going to do with what I find to be difficult? How do I treat that passage? What do I do with it? What don't I do with it? The first principle of interpretation is real simple. Always deal with the Scriptures alone. What does that mean? Don't import into your interpretation your philosophy, your opinion, or your own feelings about it. As soon as you do that, you are denying the sufficiency of the Scripture. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, meaning that it's God-breathed. God's not going to breathe out contradictions. Now, you and I might breathe out contradictions, but there's not one contradiction in one thing that God says. The contradiction is not in what God says, it's in our interpretation of it. Isn't that right? It's for an example. Today I asked Randy a question, and I acted like he knew what I was talking about. And obviously, all of a sudden, I realized he was thinking something completely different. I says, well, didn't you talk to Don? He says, no, I didn't talk to her. I says, oh, I thought maybe Don would have told you. <laughs> so I got involved with Randy about something about a conversation that he was not in the middle of it. He didn't have the full conversation. So anytime you look at a passage of Scripture and you're not involved with the full conversation of that Scripture, you're not in, you're not in sync with the whole context of that Scripture. And you can listen to any conversation. I don't care who it is. You can listen to any conversation, politically especially. You listen to these political conversations, you find out that people are not listening to things in context. And they're taking implications as though they're explicit statements. And we got to be careful for that. So how do we deal with that? We always compare second principle. First principle, deal with Scripture alone. Forget your ideas. Forget your opinions. Forget your philosophy. Forget your feelings. Forget all that. Scripture alone. Let the Scripture do the talking. God, everything ought to be settled with Him and not with you. So what do you do then? You compare Scripture with Scripture. Always compare Scripture with Scripture. Whatever you're studying, you're going to find that there's going to be other Scriptures that are going to talk about that. So you compare Scriptures with Scripture. And if Scripture contradicts Scripture, as you go down that process, you can be certain that your conclusions are false. They're going to be false because there's no contradictions in the Word of God. If they seem to be, it's because of the way you're viewing what you're reading. Okay, the third principle is always begin with a proof text. A proof text is a fundamental basic statement of Scripture that is unambiguous, that is very clear. It cannot be interpreted only but one way. There's just impossible to get more than one conclusion from it. So you always begin with the proof text, meaning you always begin with, with what's clear to you, especially when you're dealing with things that are unclear. For an example, John 10, verse 27 and 29 is a proof text that cannot be interpreted any other way. And it simply says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall, what? Never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. That's not enough. He goes on to say in verse 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You're not going to get us out of Jesus' hand, and you're not going to get us out of the Father's hand. 
and none of us will perish. Now, what can you do with interpreting that verse of Scripture? You can't interpret it any other way than when you're saved, you're saved for certain. That's all you can find in that Scripture. There's nothing that gives you options, no options with this verse. It's called a proof text, a proof text. Okay, so what are we going to do? Always begin with Scripture. Don't bring in your own ideas. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Always begin with the proof text. Always begin with the proof text. Number four, always deal with the difficult and doubtful, doubtful statements of the Bible in the light of a proof text. There are going to be difficult statements that you're going to look at. And some of those statements you look at are going to be doubtful to you. You're, they're going to have the word if in there. And you're going to wonder, oh, no, oh, my, what does that mean? Could I be lost? Am I really saved? And you're going to have to take those kind of passages of Scripture and try to find an explanation of those difficult passages that's consistent with the proof text that is, that is consistent that it doesn't contradict Scripture and that it doesn't contradict the cardinal doctrines of the Word of God. Cardinal doctrines are doctrines that cannot be disputed. Can anyone dispute that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That's indisputable. Can anybody dispute the great attributes of God, that He's righteous, that He's holy, that He's merciful, that He's compassionate, that He's all-knowing, He's almighty, He's all-powerful? These are indisputable facts. So you go to the indisputable, you go to the most clear and you find the scriptures that you're clear on and the ones that maybe you weren't so clear on that you're very clear on now. And you always measure your, your unclear statements and your doubtful statements next to them and see how they measure up. And if they're not measuring up very good, then just realize how you're looking at that verse, how you're approaching that verse. Something's wrong with your approach. Something's wrong with your thinking. There's nothing wrong with what you're reading. It's what you're doing with what you're reading. There's something wrong with that. Okay. Heresies and error throughout the history of the church have always been built on an isolated text. So never ever try to build or establish a position or a doctrine upon an isolated, isolated text. Many have done this and have brought great hurt and harm to the church. So let's never do that. And then, number five, pay careful attention to the details. Because if you pay careful attention to the details, you will not, you will not find yourself banking on isolated text. Pay attention to the details. The details will never let you isolate a text. The isolated text means you jump into a chapter and you pick a verse. You jump into a paragraph and you pick a verse. That's always wrong. Now, have you noticed, those of you that have been with me a long time, I used to never preach and teach verse by verse, never used to do that. But then you found me doing it, verse by verse. And the reason why I do verse by verse is because I found out if I go verse by verse, I cannot misinterpret those passages of Scripture because the context of the Scriptures won't let me do it. The context of the scripture keeps pulling me back to the context. And the context, context keeps sending me back into the paragraph. And the paragraph keeps sending me back into the chapter. And the, that chapter sends me back into the previous chapter. And let me tell you something. I'm really glad that I started doing this. Because one of the greatest things, that my greatest concern was, ever since I was a baby Christian to today is what does the Bible really say about this? Or what does the Bible really say about that? And I used to come around folks that had all kinds of ideas, and not one of those individuals ever taught verse by verse. They were topical preachers. They're preaching on healing, preaching on faith, they're preaching on prayer, they're preaching on the Holy Spirit, they're preaching on the gifts of the Spirit, they're preaching on the move of God, they're preaching on prosperity, they're preaching on marriage, they're preaching on this, and just topical preaching. Now, there's nothing wrong with topical preaching if you're an individual that has been rooted and grounded in all the scriptures that revolve around that particular topic because you have done verse-by-verse -verse teaching. But I'm just here to tell you, to do verse-by-verse -verse teaching from experience, it is hard work. Finally.
the last principle of interpretation, never ever forget this. This is key. Who is doing the talking? Is it Jesus? Is, is, is it the Apostle Paul? Is it the Pharisee? Who is it? Is it Moses? Who's doing the talking? Who? Next one is what? What are they talking about? What is Jesus talking about? What's Paul talk, Peter talking about? What's Apostle John talking about? What's the Pharisees talking about? What's, what's the woman with the issue of blood talking about? What are they talking about? Who's doing the talking? What are they talking about? Next, who are they talking to? Who are they talking to? Are they talking to a Jew? Are they talking to a religious man? Are they talking to a Pharisee? Are they talking to an unbeliever? Are they talking to a Gentile? Are they talking to a saved Gentile, unsaved Gentile? Are they talking to the church? Are they talking to the church? In what way are they talking to the church? You're going to have to ask yourself those questions. Otherwise, you'll do what most of us have done in the past. We, we just kind of Cadillac cruise through the, cruise, go cruising through the Bible, page after page, just cruising through there. When you cruise through the Bible, you don't get anything. You don't enjoy what you're reading. It's like a hungry man coming to the table, and in one minute he ate his dinner. He, does, he, 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 never, he never had a chance to enjoy anything. He's like, Bloop, it's down. He runs out the door. Right, Scott? Lisa gave me the eyeball, Scott, so I had to pass it on. <laughs> okay. So let's look at some scriptures then, okay? And let's apply the things. First up, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, which I'll only spend just a minute here with. You know this verse. I've taught on it quite a few times. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God, but those who do the will of my Father. Now, who is Jesus talking about here? Is he talking about Christians? Well, at the end of the verse, he says, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, for I never knew you. Depart from me. Well, that can't be Christians because the Christians know us, doesn't it? The Lord knows Christians, right? And Christians don't practice lawlessness. We went through those verses of Scripture two weeks ago. They don't practice lawlessness. They practice doing the will of the Father. They practice keeping His commandments. So that can't apply to us. Cannot apply to you and me. But it applies to a whole host of people because the Word says many. And someone said one time the word many means a multitude. So now when you read passages of Scripture, you have to realize that there's going to be a lot of Scriptures that are going to be addressing what the Bible calls false converts. Those that, that, that Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. So then you look at me, you look with me to Mark chapter 13. And in Mark chapter 13, we find the sower, the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, you have... Four kinds of ground, right? You got, the, you got the wayside ground, you got the stony ground, and you got the thorny ground. All, th all three things about that thorny ground, they have all something in common. They all were affected by the word. The word came to them in one way, one form or fashion or the other. But those three kinds of ground never bore any fruit. No fruit whatsoever. Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. What did he mean by that? Meaning that you can look at an individual and test the fruits of their life that they're exhibiting. How would you do that? How would you test the fruits? You, you test the fruits by looking at that person and measuring them up against, up against the Beatitudes. See, Jesus is not going to say, you'll know them by their fruits and not give you any way to measure it. He already told you how you can measure it. Doing the will of the Father. Well, who are those who do the will of the Father? Those who are poor in spirit. They can't find any reason for God to accept them. So they find themselves trusting Christ and Him alone. They mourn over their sins because even though they're called to live a godly life, they know they fall far short from it and they hate themselves about it. They abhor themselves for it. They're blessed are the meek. They're meek. They know, the real, they, know, they know what they really are. They don't have any errors about themselves, so they have a very difficult time ever talking about another individual, another human being, because they see themselves far worse than the person they would criticize. They're very meek. They hunger and thirst after righteousness because they long for, for what God wants in their life, and they know only God can provide that in their life. See? So you measure them up against the Beatitudes, and there's many more you can measure them up against, but we'll just stop right there. In Matthew 13, 23, the Lord Jesus says, but, he, but 
He who receives the seed on the good ground. Now, here's the good ground in contrast to those other three kinds of grounds. This individual hears the word. And what happens to him when he hears the word? He understands it. Now, we know if, if you understand the word of God, you must be born of the spirit. Because we've looked at those scriptures over there in, in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that says the natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God. Neither can he understand them. Because they're spiritually discerned. So the good ground speaks to someone who's born again. We've already talked about being born again, being regenerated is under the heading of the call of God that comes to us in the power of the Holy Spirit that brings us to a place of faith, which is a tool and instrument that God uses by which he declares us to be justified in his sight for believing on his son. Can you see that, everybody? Luke 8, 15, he goes on to say, but the one, the, but the one that fell on good ground are those who having, who having heard the word with a noble and good heart. Where did they get that noble and good heart? The Bible says there's none good. No, not one. There's none seeking that. Good. So where do you get the good and noble heart? You got it from God. He regenerated. He gave you a new birth. He called you that you might be justified by faith in Christ Jesus. Can you see that, everybody? It's real plain and simple. Now, what some people do with this verse, they say, well, all these other three people, they came to Christ, they believed on Christ, but they fell away. I sure hope I don't fall away. No, those other three kinds of ground are the same kind of people you read in Matthew chapter 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. Why? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. No fruit there. Can you see that, everybody? Is that real clear to you? That should be hard to see. That should be very easy to see. The next one is in Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 36 and 42 is the parable of the tares of the field. And once again, this is a representation of what you see in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter. It represents false converts, those who think they're saved, but they're not. And this is complementing what we just read in Matthew 13 of the sower souls the word. It's complementing that. It's called the parable of the dragnet. Again, Jesus says in verse uh, 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that is cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels. Now, what's the good? We just read what the good is, the good of noble heart. The good are those with the good ground, right? Those that were regenerated, those that were called according to his purpose. They were put into the, uh, the good were gathered into vessels, but threw away the bad. To, what's the bad? The bad were not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of God. The three kinds of ground that bore no fruit. They may have professed Christ, but they didn't know Christ and Christ didn't know them. We have to realize as a, as a church family that this is true about us. That's why no one should ever come to me and say, uh, if, if someone who kind of fluctuates in and out of the church from time to time, and then you don't see him for a while. What about that person? Just realize that person may be a person who professes Christ but doesn't necessarily know Christ. They also could be someone who professes Christ that knows Christ but is going through lots of struggles. So you've got to be very, 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 very careful. The Lord says, judge not lest you be judged. So what you have to do in a situation like that, you always want to operate on the principle of mercy. <coughs> Just be merciful, but never be, but never be thrown or never be, be thrown into amazement. Someone that you thought was a, such a Christian all of a sudden isn't among us any longer. Just realize that. Okay, as we go on, we look at it, uh, we, uh, we, we continue to read and it says, uh, so verse 49, so it'll be at the end of the age, the angels will come and separate the wicked from the just. So notice the good must have been the just. The wicked is, are the bad, and he cast them into the furnace of fire, and there there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The same kind of language that you read all over in the scriptures about false converts, there it is. So this does not apply, so this helps us to understand when we read scriptures that sometimes you have to discern, is this talking about a true Christian here, or is this talking about someone that only professes to be a Christian? Next. We have Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. This is the parable of the ten virgins. There were five of these virgins that were invited to the wedding fest. 
that were considered to be foolish, ten considered to be wise. And the door was finally shut on the foolish ones. Now, and while the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins who when their lamps went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, to, uh, took their lamps and with their, and with their lamps, took oil with, uh, in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Slumbered and slept is your phrase there you have to be careful of. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some, some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should, be, should not be enough for us, you, uh, for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went, with, went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. And afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord. Is that a familiar passage? Lord, Lord, just like Matthew 7, open to us. But he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Is that kind of familiar? What's the next one say? Watch therefore, for you, neither, for, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Why is that warning there? Because the warning there is to give urgency, to give heed to the gospel message. These individuals did not give heed to the gospel message. When you look back at Matthew 7, we didn't take time to look at this, but Matthew 7, 21 through 23 is elaborated upon and explained even further in the following verses, verses uh, 24 through 27, about the, about the foolish, the wise and the foolish man. The wise man built on the rock, the foolish man built on the sand, and the uh, foolish man's house, the storms came against his house, they came against the wise man's house, and his house was destroyed. The house there represents what he believed in. He believed he wanted a house. The wise man believed he wanted a house. But the wise man wanted a house that would stand. The, 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 the foolish man could care less if it stood or not. He wasn't concerned about that issue. Foundation there is what's the foundation of what you believe. He didn't want the foundation of Christ. He was fine with his own religious sand as his foundation. And it fell off from underneath him on judgment day. And so what, what you see when you read these things, when you, see, when you read these things, is that the Lord's given us warnings here. Though he's pointing out the true and the false, he's given warnings to both that they ought to give great heed to the gospel message and not to look upon it lightly. And that's something you find throughout the scriptures. Now, in John chapter 15, verse 6, is a verse that oftentimes... Uh, people have problems with. It says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, in the light of everything that we've taught here, in the light of all of our proof text, this cannot refer to a, a, a true Christian. This cannot, this does, those proof texts I gave you can't perish. I keep you. My Father keeps you. Nobody can get you out of our hand. What do you do with that? What do you do with that? So you've got to look at this, how all that to be interpreted. Well, you just got done looking at scriptures that people profess to know Christ, profess to, to abide with Christ and to walk with Christ, but they weren't. They just thought they were and said that they were, but they weren't. And so the way you interpret that is, is that these individuals simply profess to abide in Christ. They profess to be his disciples, but they did not continue with him. And that's what abide means. Abide means to remain, but they never remained. They didn't continue with him, which ultimately proves they were not born of him. Again, I don't know if you recall all these scriptures, but back two weeks ago, we looked at those verses of scripture about those that know God and that abide in him are those that are born of God. These people are not that in that condition. Here's another verse of scripture that goes right along with this that will help you. It's John 6, verse 66. These are the people that seen the miracles of the, multi of, the, of the multiplying of the loaves and fishes. They wanted to take Jesus and make him their king. Uh, 
Jesus began to talk more directly about who he is and why they need him. They got upset with about what he had to say about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, believing on him in that sense. And so the scripture says, from that time, many from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Now, some people look at that and say, see, you can be saved for a while and not walk with him no more and lose your salvation because you're not walking with him no more. All this is proof that they never abided in him. They never remained in him. And that proof is they were not being kept by God. Just, just that simple. Once you know what the scripture is, have to say that's all it means. They're not being kept by God. So they're not continuing with him. They're, they're the, the, many, the many that say, Lord, Lord. They're the virgins that say, Lord, Lord. They're the ones that the Lord says, I don't know you. Who are the ones that he said that he kept? The ones that the Father gave me. The Father gave them to him so he knew them. And he kept them. And nobody that was given to him by the Father is going to perish. And he's going to keep them. No one's taking them out of his hand. Do you see that, everyone? Here's another one. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us. But they were not of us. They were not of us. They were not of us. For had they been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were none of us. So this is pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? But it helps you to understand these verses that these branches that don't abide in me, they'll be, they will be burned. Well, you find out they're not really of the Lord in the first place. They only professed to, to be. They only looked like they were. Here's another one, everybody. This is a difficult one. See, I'm giving you the easy ones. Now I'm going to go to, I'm easing up to the difficult ones, okay? The ones that you're, but now you've got a platform to look at these verses with. 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. This is a faithful saying. If we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If, he's, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. What do you do with that verse of Scripture? Well, look at it. Those who endure represent the true believer. You can see that. Those that deny him are like those that we've read about. In John 6, 66, his disciples walked with him no more. They're like the sower, the parable of the sower. They're like the foolish virgins. There are those that says, I never knew you. Depart from me. They can't be those that were given to him by the Father, can't be. He said, they don't perish. He says that no one can get them out of my hand. Jesus prayed that they be kept, so they can't, they can't be those individuals. So what you're trying to do when you read these passages of Scripture, you're trying to ask yourself, who is this applied to? Does this apply to Jews? Does this apply to Gentiles? Does this apply to unsaved people? Does this apply to saved people, religious people, professing Christians? You have to ask yourself those questions. Who's doing the talking? Who are they talking to? What are they talking about? You've got to ask yourself those questions. Then you can come up with the right conclusion. Next, another scripture that people misunderstand as falling from grace, but are actually warnings not to become entangled with false doctrine. 1 Timothy 1.19. Listen to this verse. All these verses used to have me totally, completely confused. And I was so foolish to talk to my little Lisa here and say, Lisa, I think a person can lose their salvation. Remember I used to talk to you about that? Lisa said, well, Pastor, I don't know how anybody can leave them once they know them. I said, well, I feel the exact same way, but I got all these verses. I didn't know how to handle these verses, and I'm a pastor. But because I had that conversation with you, I buckled down. I thought to myself, I'm going to find out about all of this. I'm not going to allow someone... I'm not going to open up my mouth like a bird in a nest with my mouth wide open and let people poke things in there, and I'm just going to believe what they tell me. No, I'm going to go to the Word of God, and I'm going to study. And you can ask Marty. Sometimes I'm down there at 7 o'clock in the morning till midnight, and combing scriptures, combing commentaries, doing all of this, so you can be assured when you listen to the Word of God, it's right. And it still might be wrong, because we don't know. We only know, you know, nobody knows everything they ought to know, <laughs> Right? All, you can, uh, all I hope to do is be known in your mind as I got an honest pastor that tries his best. That's all I can try to do. It's the best I can do for you. 